going to give an abbreviated version of his, of his CV. Um, and his training initially was in electrophysiology up until 2002. Um, and in rodent and rodent and human behavior, brain circuit based methodologies, imaging and microscopy. Um, his research interests lie, however, in translational research and psychiatric neuroscience, with a particular emphasis on understanding the role of dysregulation and oxidative stress in the pathophysiology of schizophrenia, autism, and depression. Now, if that's not a mouthful, then I don't know what is. But he was the first assistant in the Department of Cell Biology and Morphology at the University of Lausanne. Uh, he also served as a senior research associate in the Unit for Research in Schizophrenia in the Center for Psychiatric Neuroscience in Lausanne University Hospital in Switzerland. And he also served as a senior lecturer at assistant professor level in developmental neuroscience in the Faculty of Biology and Medicine at the University of Lausanne. He received his uh, undergraduate research, he was an undergraduate research fellow with Sandoz Research Institute in Bern, in Switzerland, BSc with honors, uh, University of West England in 1997, training electrophysiology, primate surgery, and primate behavior in Zurich University, uh, followed with, with uh, his PhD in neuroscience at Zurich University Hospital. Dat is het ding wat mens noem in navorsing, gepraat van jou RG-telling, en sy RG-telling wat praat, die so van die hoeveelheid keer wat mense dit sal sien, en raak lees, en daarna verwijs en goed, staan op 32, wat geweldig hoog is, um, en daar is talle publikaties wat hy al deel gehad het, he has authored a, num a number of articles, um, and also chapters and books, but possibly the most important part of his, of his CV is that in 2004 he was a baptized member, became a baptized member of the SDA Church in Switzerland. He was appointed as a church elder in the Advent Fellowship Geneva Church in 2010. In 2007 he served as the Vice President of Adventist Layman Industries, ASI, in Switzerland. He became a board member of ASI and served for that in 2010 to 2020 and he became the president of ASI Switzerland in 2015. And I'm not entirely sure about the date in which, forgive me, I can't read the CV fast enough, the date in which you left Neurosant. The fall of 20. The herfs van 2021, toet hy vir al die neurofysiologie, die neurologie werk, het hy gesê, tot ziens in die universiteitswereld en aan een volle professorskap en daar en hy gesê, dankie tot ziens, ek gaan vir Jesus dien. I'm going to serve the Lord. And he currently serves as the, 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 the assistant to uh, Dwayne McKee, the president of Adventist World Radio. We are privileged to have him here. Mighty God and everlasting Father, we stand before you at all knowing and seeing how good you are to each and every one of us. Father, thank you for bringing your children to the house of prayer today. Father, we come just as we are, but we will not leave just as we are because we know that transformation happens when we have an encounter with Jesus. Again, it is my earnest plea that the praises of our lips be acceptable in thy sight because of your son, Jesus. And we thank you for the ministration of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. And for that introduction, I just want to sum it up. Not to do away what the pastor said. Uh, it's just me. It's just me. This is my, my philosophy, my way of working. Uh, I'm asked to introduce, how do we introduce you? You can introduce me in four words. Lost, but now found. Actually, lost, but now found. So you see, I knew I lost count. And that's all. Uh, but however, this is uh, the things that I have done in my life. But the only thing that really counts most is what Jesus has done in my life. 
I have given you a little bit of how I came into the Adventist church. I became a Seventh-day Adventist through Bible prophecy. It was Bible prophecy that changed my life. It was the Word of God that changed my life. I was with the best of the best in neuroscience. My, one of my doctor father, I think it's the same in, in Dutch or in African, Dr. Father, your thesis supervisor. One of them is named, uh, he passed on last year or two years ago, because 2020, yes, he passed on. His name is uh, Lawrence Young. And Professor Lawrence Young, some MIT graduate, Harvard graduate, a professor in uh, neuroscience as well as in uh, space. And he's actually an astronaut. He's been to the moon several times. And I had the bless, uh, you know, privilege of knowing these guys uh, right next door to, my, to the laboratory where I was trained is uh, Professor Ralph Sinkarnago. He's a Nobel Prize laureate, 1986 for medicine. And so University of Zurich is where Einstein was. And so you, you're surrounded with this academic excellence and people of sharp mind. But as I already told you, as sharp of mind can be, there's something lacking. And I was surrounded there, and I'm seeing all these people thinking, I want to be like that? Yes, glossy name, glossy CV, but at the end of the day, you come back to an empty home with no one. Broken family, children, nowhere to be found. And it was the beginning of my search for something tangible, something that will satisfy the longing of human heart. I thought, I tried academic excellence. That did not work. Tried girlfriends, young people. That did not work. Tried money. That did not work. And I can tell you only truly, the only thing that worked and lasted thus far, and that's why I stand before you, is the Word of God. Because the Word of God is the same as the living God. Amen? So when I became a Seventh-day Adventist, I was passionate to share that which I had discovered with others. Just to give you a, a scenario, I was walking. I walked into a train once. I was new, newly Adventist, walking to the train, and I prayed already, Lord, you know, every day my prayers, throw me someone on my path that needs you. Throw someone on my path that needs you. And so I entered the train, and as I was walking into the train, this guy smiling at me from a distance. And I thought, uh-oh. I mean, this is new. I, usually I have to be the one to smile, but this guy's already smiling. So I thought, okay, is my flies undone? So I look at my flies, praise God, it's up. All right? So that, and he's still smiling. Okay, I said, okay, do I do pace? You know, sometimes you, you, you brush your teeth so fast, you don't even look at the mirror. I mean, we're guys, right? We don't look at the mirror. And so don't look at it. I thought maybe I wipe my face. He's still smiling. So I continue to walk towards him and I didn't even get to say a word. His first, his, his first word or first thing he said is, can I sit with you? I thought, wow, praise God, the first work is done. So as we, I ushered him to this corner of the train. We're heading from Zurich to, to, uh, to Fribourg, that is in Switzerland. And we're somewhere in between. I, I boarded the train in Zurich. And our backside has not even touched the seat yet. It was still on the motion. And this guy asked me, what do you do? I thought, wow, this is strange. He smiles at me. First thing he says, can I sit with you? Third thing he says is, what do you do? So a bold question requires a bold response. So I told him, I'm a neuroscientist who believes in six little recreation. And his eyes pop out of the socket like a cartoon character. And said, really, tell me about it. 
sat down there, and as I tell you, when you know, when you're new in the church and you're just on fire, I was basically telling him the great controversy from the very start. Told him in 1844, Charles Darwin published his paper, The Origin of Species. And at the same time, 1844, God was raising his movement. Did you get that? Whenever God is raising something, the original, there's a counterfeit. And so I pulled this together and told him, there's a reason why during this time is the great awakening. Brought him to the word of God. He didn't even get a word in. I just I was like sitting there, da, 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 machine gunning him with everything I know. A Seventh day Adventists were information driven. Right? Somebody asked you something about the Sabbath. The person doesn't even get a word in. That's what we do. Are, are, are you with me? Right? That's how it was with me. I did not, I, it took a time for me to learn. That's not how you handle these things. Anyway, cut the long story short. Took my Bible out and gave him. By the way, all these things that I'm, I just told you, showed him in the Bible. And I have a, just the thing with the, for all the things that sums up all the, what I just told you. Here's the book. I took it out of my bag. The Great Controversy. So watch the hand. Gave it to him. And after 35 minutes of just machine gunning him about the Great Controversy, I asked him, what about you? What do you do? And he said, I'm a Catholic priest. Right? Now watch, watch the hand. All right? This is what happened. Really? And he said, yes. Uh, uh, you know, I'm, I lo I'm lost for word now because I don't know what to say. Where is your parish? He says, uh, actually, I'm a professor at a seminary. I said, oh, no. You know what went on in my mind? This guy is, is not ready. This guy is not ready. In my mind, I was defeated. In my mind, what was going on was, I have just done my Savior dishonor. And, you know, my heart sank right there. He was talking and telling me something. I'm no longer listening. I'm just looking at him, staring at him. Uh-huh, uh-huh. I'm looking at the, when is the next stop going to be because I'm getting out of the train. That's how it was for me. And I said, Lord, just take my most colorful, dirty socks and shove it in my mouth. I talk too much. So, I gave it to him. I had to let go because he won't let go. And I said, could you, could you just give me the book back? I want to give you my email address. And I want to write something that reminds you of this conversation. And so I, show, I wrote a, a, a short uh, note in there for him because I thought maybe he's not ready. I don't want him to throw it away. I want it to be meaningful to him and just write something meaningful, sentimental, that he will keep the book just because of what I wrote. So that's what's the strategy now. And then finally wrote my email address. The moment that train stopped, goodbye. I didn't call him father. <laughs> goodbye, <laughs> Mr. Brother. <laughs> professor, in fact, I had a professor. So I left. And you know, when you do these things daily, you forget about it. Uh, three months down the line, uh, time passed, I received an email. It says, Dear Brother Kabunko, thinking, oh, I don't recognize the name. Brother, is he from the division? You know how it is, like the leadership sometimes writes you, and the first thing they say, Brother, something. So, and it's next line, thank you for that book, The Great Controversy. My mind says, okay, which one? You know, second line. It says, I thoroughly enjoyed that book. Okay. The third one. I believe every seminarian should have a copy of this book. 
Fourth line, where can I get more of this book? I tell you, I almost fell off my chair. I ran to my closet, that's for my, my bookshelves, got all the reserve bullets I have, my ammunitions, put them in the box, ready to be, ready to be sent that same day. What was going in my mind? This guy is not ready. He was. Our message is entitled, The Solemn Promise. The Solemn Promise. As I am told by people before I came here, the church you're going to is probably one of the most conservative church in South Africa. Okay, are you trying to scare me? <laughs> Just talking to myself. It's okay. I'm not threatened by that. Actually, I love God's people. And, you know, all these things. So I know. I know that you're familiar with a quote that says, the primitive godliness, revival of primitive godliness is the most urgent of all our needs. To seek this should be our first work. You're familiar with that, right? And this cannot happen without prayer. Yes or no? That's what it says. Now here's another one. I'm sure you're familiar with this too. One of my all-time favorite testimonies for the church, volume 7, page 138. The greatest wealth of truth ever entrusted to mortals. The greatest wealth of truth ever entrusted to mortals. The most solemn and fearful warning ever entrusted to man has been committed to them to give to the world. Chew that one for a while. The greatest wealth of truth ever entrusted to mortals. The most solemn and fearful warning ever entrusted to man has been given to you to give to the world. And when I look at this text, I am telling you, I don't pump my shoulder up. It brings to my knees. It brings me to my knees in humility because of the solemn responsibility ever entrusted to us as God's last day people. The solemn promise. How, you know, I come up here, another young person at the camp meeting, told me, how are we going to bring this gospel to the world? So many people are being brought, uh, you know, brought into the world each day. How is it possible? I travel around the world for AWR Adventist World Radio. I have been to places. I can tell you, no way man could do this work. There's just no way. I will share some of those stories with you today. There's just no way. But God has provided a way. And that's why the message is entitled, The Solemn Promise. Notice, the top 10 revolutions felt around the world, according to Google. Right? Number, at number 10, the Haitian Revolution. At number 9, the Iranian Revolution. At number eight, the Cuban Revolution. At number seven, the Chinese Revolution. At number six, the Turk Revolution. Number five, the Taiping Revolution. Number four, the Great October Socialist Revolution. Number three, the Glorious Revolution. Number two, the American Revolution. And number one, the French Revolution. In this revolution, a power was decimated from one and received by another, mostly through a bloody conflict. A revolution from the Latin word revolucio means turn around. It is a fundamental change in power or organization structure that takes place over a relatively short period of time. It is often used and referred to political change. 
Revolution has occurred throughout the human history. And it has varied wildly in terms of method, duration, and political ideologies. Their results include major changes in culture, in economy, social political institutions. In some cases, revolution was needed for the changing of the course of humanity. Men took it upon themselves to enjoy the freedom that we enjoy today. But it is temporary. Now I have news for you. Jesus began the greatest of all revolution in history. One, <laughs> notice, because in every revolution, there's always a promise of power. And once this power is received, there will be change. Why do you think people band together? There's an outcry for change. They believe that synergy amongst the people, there will be more powerful, they will receive power. And they will re when they receive this power, you'll be able to do this and that. And before you know it, change is on the horizon. Jesus, the greatest revolutionist of all times, promised something. Let's go to that promise. Go with me to the book of Acts, chapter 1. Book of Acts, chapter 1. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Thank you. Acts. And when you get there, say amen. When you need more time, say mercy. If you don't have a Bible, say pray for me. All right. Amen? All right. Notice what it says. Verse 7. And read to your hearing from the King James Version. And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the time or the season which the Father had put in his own power. But you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you will be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, in Judea, and in Samaria, and on the uttermost part of the earth. That's what the Bible says. Christ, when raising up the Christian movement, began with a promise of power. But Jesus did not declare the promise that would come by murder, politics, money, rape, betrayal of Caesars, or overthrow of governments. To begin the greatest movement that Jesus was raising, He promised that the power would come not by the unmentionables. It is the greatest movement because 34% of the global population claim to be Christians. Right? Islam is still about 28%. That means more than a third of the population of the world claim to follow Christ, who live with no earthly possession. Christ was homeless in this world. Did you know that? Remember what he said? Foxes have holes. You want to follow me? Foxes have holes. Birds have nests. But the Son of Man have nowhere to lay his head. You want to follow me? I am couch surfing at Peter's home. I am often at Lazarus' home. I had no, he had nothing. All that Jesus had was a shirt on his back and the sandals on his feet. No budget for his evangelistic trips. Even a ride he didn't have. He had to tell someone to go and borrow a donkey. That's fascinating. Christ was surfing, couch surfing at the brethren's home. Not only Christianity has given rise to every field of learning, even atheists enjoy to sing and listen to Handel's Messiah. That's quite fascinating, isn't it? They claim to be atheists, but they sit there and listen and enjoy Handel's Messiah? Hmm. You see, non-Christians still Christian songs. This is a movement of Jesus. Go with me to the book of Luke. 
book of Luke chapter 9. <coughs> Excuse me. Book of Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke. Chapter 9, go with me. When you get there, let me know by saying amen. You need more time, don't hesitate to say, say mercy. We move as one. No one left behind here. We are a church. Amen? All right. Notice what it says. Then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power. I mean, I'm not going to teach you Greek, but they will say dunamis. And authority. Exousia. Over all devils and to cure diseases. Now think about it for a while here. Look at the verses. Why would Jesus give power in Acts chapter 1 verse 8 when he already gave it in Luke chapter 9 verse 1? Note that the author of the book of Luke and Acts is the same person. Now what can we conclude? We can conclude that Whatever power is given in Acts chapter 1 verse 8 is not the same power that was given in Luke chapter 9 verse 1. If it was the same, then at least one of the disciples would have said, But Lord, wait a minute Lord, you've already given that to us. I mean, Thomas would have raised it, doubting Thomas. Philip would have said, but what do you mean, Lord? What exactly do you mean? Peter would have said, Lord, you already gave that to us. We heal the sick. The things you have showed us. So what does Acts chapter 1 verse 8 mean? That when Jesus said to Thomas, when Jesus said to Philip, when Jesus said to Peter, John, and others, not one raised a question. They understood that what Jesus promised here was something they have not yet received in its fullness. In other words, Jesus is saying, there's a power you do not currently possess. This promise has not yet come to you. You do not yet possess it. So what is Jesus promising here? Because it is something that they do not yet possess. You see, before Pentecost, the disciples did great and mighty things for God. Would you agree? Yes or no? Would you agree with me? Notice, Peter walked on water before Pentecost already. Peter and his disciples healed people as they walked amongst the sick. They were casting out demons from men at their camp meetings and retreats and e-camps in those days. We could say that they were already spiritual celebrity. If we may be able to, uh, to allow, allow to use such term. If we were there, we would have said, man, those guys are super spiritual, super godly. Imagine, you're there. Peter walks into the camp meeting. And you just witness this guy cast out demon. You've seen this guy heal the sick. What would go in your mind? Well, Peter, you're super godly. Tell us your, your recipe. Uh, you must pray all day. You're understanding me? Because this is what, you know, when, when, when we do something, come in and we preach powerful and people respond, young people come and say, man, how many hours do you spend praying? They think I get up at 2 o'clock in the morning and pray until I begin preaching. You have no idea. Just like you, I have to come to the feet of Jesus. And I struggle also to get out of bed, especially when you don't get enough sleep. You have to get up, and you don't want to get up, but you know you have to get up. And you have to come and say, Jesus, you know what? I had a tough night, but I come to you this morning, nonetheless, because I need you. So what is Jesus promising? I don't know about you, but I'm just catching up with Peter when he left his net to follow Jesus. I am just catching up with the two disciples in John chapter 1. When Jesus says, what are you looking for? Remember, the, the, Jesus, John the baptizer, was preaching. 
And he was speaking, the Lamb of God that taketh the sin of the world. And by the way, here they, there he is. That's the man. The Bible tells us, the disciples of John look unto Jesus. And there were two of them following Jesus. As Jesus was walking, these two guys were following behind him. Jesus turns around and says, what, what do you seek? The answer is, where do you live? Question with a question. What do you seek? What are you looking for? Uh, where do you live, Lord? Jesus says, come and see. Come and see. Not where he lives. Come and see what you are looking for. It's an invitation to the disciples to come to have an experience with Jesus consistent with his word. I came out of that camp meeting in Heart and Boss with heavy heart. Joy and heavy heart. Mixed. Joy because I saw how God's children, the young people, were responding to the word of God. At the same time, I saw the burden. Why? Because I know they're going to go home from the camp meeting and that somehow they're going to be back into the old way. You know how it is? We go to camp meeting, we get revived, boom! All done. Then we go back to home and somehow we are dogged by the things, the cares of life. Yes or no? Isn't that how it is, church? Come on, tell me. Am I mistaken uh, that here in South Africa that doesn't happen? So I'm burdened. And Jesus sends out an invitation. Come and see what you're looking for. And the Bible tells us, right? The Bible tells us, this, this guys have been following Jesus, they abode with Jesus. And guess what? When they spent time with Him, afterwards they went home, says, we have found! We have found what we are looking for. We have found what the whole nation has been waiting for. The question I have for you, church, have you found? Have we gone out to proclaim to all around us, we have found all that we're looking for? Yesterday, I was traveling together with Dan Nell, our AWR engineer and cell phone manager. <coughs> you, you asked him, we were together. And we were flying from Hodgepreit. I'm still bad pronouncing it, but you know where it is, right? Hodgepreit. Did I get it correctly? Okay. Close enough. All right. Thank you. Close enough. It's okay. It's good. For now. To, to, to Joburg. And, you know, that morning I prayed, Lord, throw someone up my path that needs you today. So, went to the airport. And, uh, okay, what, what, what do we do here? So, Passing the x-ray machines, I started singing. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that, you know the song? Lord within, the x-ray officer looked at me. He couldn't hear, grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will, and he, he just, and I said, you know, you can give me a microphone, I'll sing for everyone. I'm not a singer, but I'll sing for everyone. And I said, oh, I would like to join you. Right? I said, all right. What hymns do you want? What hymns do you know? We'll sing right here. We'll provide the music to all the people going through the airport. And my, my bags went there through the x-ray machine. You know? And there was this woman. Her name is Elizabeth. And the guy's name, I didn't ask for, for his name yet. So he was just fascinated. Then I changed tune. It is so sweet to trust as I was putting my things in my bag. Jesus, just to take him at his word. And he was just there listening. I said, okay, Lord, are you trying to tell me something? So, but there's a cue, there's a line. All right, you know how it is in the security. Like, like, people like, 
let me get through. Anyway, I went away a while to get things, uh, get things in order. I asked Dan, Dan, I'm out of, I'm out of bullets. I'm out of uh, tracks. Do you have some? So I went to my Bible, and I still found some uh, few. I managed to, to, uh, to scavenge a couple of tracks. But he gave me also this uh, three angels message from Clash of Mind that has five things on three angels message. Uh, I said, okay, this one. Okay, so I went back to him. Three is so sweet. I stood next to him. I said, you want, you want to sing with me? And I said, well, I'd love to. Maybe afterwards. And I said, okay, I understand. But, you know, before I go, I want you to have this. Gave him tracks, War in Heaven, and another one, The Promises of God, and that uh, three angels message. And he looked at them with big eyes and said, oh, thank you so much. Thank you. I says, one more thing. I'd like to pray for you. <laughs> I said, now? Yeah, yeah, right now. What he did? Stop everything. And we're going to pray. The queue stopped. The machine stopped. Prayed right there and then. Short prayer. Amen. And all the other staff were just looking. Because they know it never happened before. So walk away from that one. Went back to my seat with Dan. Just told him what had happened. But before I walked, he says, can I have your number? <laughs> Perfect, because some, these things I forget. I said, sure, I'll give you my WhatsApp number. So tell me what you think of what you read. So gave it to him. And when I arrived here, uh, he wrote me already. Okay, he says, hello, man of God. How was your flight? My response, my dear brother, thank you for your kind message. My flight went well. Arrived safely, praying for you. My pleasure to meet you. It's a beginning. Why? Because after this, he's going to be receiving something from me. What is the point? Point is this. Have you found what you're looking for? Because if you have found what you're looking for, guess what? He that is drunk from the well becomes a fountain of living water unto others. And you don't have, there's no switch button on and off. There's no switch button. One of my favorite outreach posts is the, the plane. You know? You know why? They're stuck with you. They're not going anywhere for the next few hours. Right? They may want to avoid you, but they're stuck with you on the plane. So this is what you do for those of you flyers. Just a tip and advice. Of course, you need to pray. Because there are things that are taking place that you do not see. There's power at work. Much is being done behind the scene. But you must be praying. Very simple principle. I do is before I, Lord, there's someone on this plane that needs you. Look how packed the plane is. Please put him next to me. Or if not next to me, on the line in the toilet. What does that mean? Two hours before you land, if you're on a long flight, everyone wants to go to the toilet to brush their teeth. You know, especially ladies, they want to freshen up. And also to empty your bladder. That's just the normal thing. You watch, you, you, next time you, have, you fly somewhere, long flight, two hours before you land, look to the back of the plane. And you will see a line. So you go, but make sure when you go, you've done your business. Because you're not there any longer to go to the toilet. You're there to engage with someone who needs Jesus. So you're standing there, just standing there. And you say, Lord, show me in this line the person that needs the bath, the toilet most. And the Lord will reveal it to you. I guarantee you, it has never failed me. 
How do you identify them? <sighs> they're restless because they're pressing their bladder. Okay? So you've identified. As moment you get close to the to the to the, your number two, what well, that's when you act. Say, Lord, you've identified, you've given me. You tell the person behind you, uh, could you please watch my space? I just need to, to talk to someone. So that person watches space. The, everyone is aware of what's taking place. You go to the person and say, hi, I think you need the bathroom mode than I do. You know, I'm right there. I'm almost at the door. Let's swap places, please. Let's swap places. And I guarantee you, they will not say no. They're bursting. Come on. So they take that space, right? They go into the toilet. They come out. And they are refreshed. Ah, paradise. And they're coming out. And I'm telling you, you could give them a Bible, you can give them anything, they will not refuse it. They will not throw something at your face. Why? Because you have just done something that no one else would. You understand me? <laughs> now you give them something, glow track, great controversy, whatever you have. And guess what? Everyone is looking at you now. You know why? Because mirror neurons in the brain starts to fire. They get one, I want one too. That's the normal behavior. That's just how it is. What are they getting? This is how you see in the market where there's a sale, someone selling something and there's a crowd, it draws more crowd. What's happening behind? And if they get something, hey, what about me? And that's when you say, don't worry. I have one for you too. One for you, one for you. And before you know it, you have changed the environment you're in. Because we can either one of the two. We can either be a thermostat or a thermometer kind of people. You know what a thermostat is? What does a thermostat do? Sets the temperature. The other one measures the temperature. As God's people, we are to set the temperature wherever we are. Why? Because we are the fountain of living water unto others. I'm not pumping up my shoulder. No, no, don't get me wrong. I have tasted the living water. And I know that living water will quench the thirsting in someone else because I have personally been quenched by the water that Christ has. Okay, we'll have to Ferrari through this, otherwise you'll be here until tomorrow. My point is this. Here, Jesus, Peter, did this miracle. Acts 1, chapter 8 says, But ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, in Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. You shall receive power and ye shall be witnesses. This is what the Bible says. It does not say you shall receive power and become Secretary General of the United Nations. That would be authority. It, it does not say you shall receive power and be, become school celebrity or valedictorian. That would be influence. It, it does not say you shall receive power and go on for four days without food. That would be energy. It doesn't say you shall receive power and be the strongest man or woman. That would be physical strength. It says you shall receive power and you shall be witnesses. In conclusion, we can say they were not witnesses at this point. I know it's heavy. Not only they were not witnesses, they have not been witnesses. Because to be a witness for Jesus, it needs the power that Jesus promised. This means that you and I cannot be witnesses without this power. And we are not witnesses because we have not received that power. Because witness has power. 
Listen, church. Even after the disciples were with Jesus for three years, there was something they were still lacking. Yes or no? The disciples lacked the ability to be a witness for Jesus. Yes, they were doing the things. But guess what? There was the fighting, squabbling among themselves. They were saying, I, I'm better than you. I'm a better soul winner than you. I have reached this and that, that. This is how it is. What, what's with them? Get over your pride, Peter. Get over your doubt, Thomas. Get over your questioning, Philip. None of these words, but simply, you shall receive power and you shall be witnesses. Why is this significant to us? Why am I preaching on this? Church, we are told in the spirit of prophecy, when Christians work in concert, you know what the concert is? There is a cellist. There's a bass. There's a violinist. There's a pianist. There's a maestro. And they work in concert. No one out of the line. Together. They do their part. And if Christians would work in concert under the power of one, for the purpose of one, they would move the world. We're not moving the world because we're not working in concert. We're doing our own thing. Just like the disciples were doing. Why is this significance? Notice what it says in the spirit of prophecy. Since this is the means by which we are to receive power. Why do we not hunger? Why do we not thirst for the gift of the Spirit? Why do we not, not talk of it? Pray for it. Preach it concerning it. The Lord is more willing to give His Holy Spirit to those who serve than parents are to give good gifts to their children. For the daily baptism of the Spirit, every worker should offer his petition to God. Companies of Christians, workers, should gather to ask for special help from, for heavenly wisdom that they may know how to plan and execute wisely. Especially should they pray that God will baptize His chosen ambassadors and mission in the field with the rich of His measure of His Spirit. Pay attention to this one. This is Acts of Apostles, page 50, paragraph 2. The presence of the Spirit with God's worker will give the proclamation of truth a power, not one, the honor or glory the world could give. Amen. Let's go to Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. Matthew 24, verse 14. You think you already know it by heart, but I want us to practice turning to it. Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. Notice what it says. Amen? Mercy? We move as one. Remember, if we would work in concert. That's why I emphasize, we practice here. Because there's no way we're going to be able to do it there if we have not done it in here. Notice what it says. Amen? I still see, I still hear pages turning. So we will wait. Amen? And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then the end shall come. Follow the progression with me. Jesus says, you shall receive power. And after receiving power, you shall be witnesses. After you are witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and in Samaria, unto the uttermost part of the world. Then the end shall come. And I love that quote from Christ's Object Lesson 415, paragraph 5. The last rays of mercy for light, the last message of mercy to be given to the world is the revelation of His character of love. The children of God are to manifest His glory in their own life and character. They are to reveal what the grace of God has done for them. The gospel is to be preached unto all the world for a witness. Did you get that? For a witness. Not that everyone is converted. 
Not that everyone accepts the message. Not that everyone is in love with the message of the church. But as a witness, it has to be a witness with power. And this was his parting words to his disciples. This power continued the revolution that Jesus began. It continued in the time of his disciples. And please tell me that in this small lo local church that we have, in this small city, this morning, when a group of people prayerfully meet to prayer after receiving the same promise from the same Lord, with the same word, and with the same spirit, it will not produce the same effect. You know who determines that? Not Jesus. Because it's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He does not change. Not the Bible, because the Word of God is forever settled in heaven. He has exalted His Word above all that is called by His name. God cannot deny Himself. God cannot lie. So there's no problem with God. There's no problem with Word. There's no problem with Jesus. We are here because the disciples received the power and continued the revolution Jesus began. It was fulfilled. And we are worshiping here today because that verse was fulfilled. This building here, nice building that you have, nice campus. I look at all when I came here and said, wow, this building would not be built. And this building would have no meaning. If Acts chapter 1 verse 8 was not fulfilled. If Peter was walking on water, healing the sick, casting out demons before he received the power in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, we have not even done some of the things that Peter was doing. Do not, I mean, I don't know about you, do you not feel the need of power that is in question here? No. In 2007, my wife and I went on a honeymoon with 47 people. Young people. It was a mission trip. Before we got married, three weeks before we married, I was doing an evangelistic meeting together with some young people in Hungary. After that two weeks of evangelistic meeting, I went home. I went from one place to move from one house to another to prepare the home for my bride and myself. On that same week, I got married on Friday at the, at the uh, registry office, you know, the, the civil. Sabbath was rest. Sunday was a church wedding. Monday came. We sent everyone home, all my families. Tuesday, we jumped on a plane together with 47 people, young people. Honeymoon. Best honeymoon ever. And we, so we, <laughs> we spent every anniversary, every year, with a group of young people, sometimes 67 young people, doing the work that God has placed in our heart. Just pleading with young people, pleading for the Spirit of God to do that has never been done before. And I tell you, it's the best time for the young people. They thought that they were there to win souls. But you know what? Their souls were won first. Friends, when you do the work of salvation, when you partake in the work that angels delight to do, when you humble yourself before God, when you plead before God and turn away from your wicked ways, the Word of God says, if we humble ourselves and pray and turn from our wicked ways, He will hear our prayers, heal our land. 2 Chronicles 7, 14. This is His promise. If we humble ourselves and pray. Young people, I encourage you. Come to church for one purpose. Come together. Plead with God to do that which He promised. And I am telling you, when you begin to do that, your lives will be changed and those around you will be changed. Take the Word of God as He promised. And He will deliver for you. Do not live, I, I was telling uh, the, the brethren, we are living a defense strategy at all times. You know what that means? How can you win a rugby match when all you do is defense? You will not. You guys are rugby nation. Right? 
Most of you have played rugby. You cannot win with just a defense. Camp meetings, come into church, this is our defense. We are fortified in the Word. Fortified and we're anchored. You need to have an offense. And that offense is, you go and share unto others what Jesus has done for you. You bring the message of salvation unto others that needs Jesus. That's the offense. And that is the only way we will have victory. Otherwise, we're just black and boxing. Block. Here's my armor. I'm putting it on, Lord. Block. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Block. I mean, sooner or later, one punch is going to get in. We need to have a strategy. And that strategy is given in His Word. If you don't know, you ask uh, uh, Elder Marius here. He will teach you cell phone evangelism. An offense. Took young people out. I am telling you. On the third night, we were doing a meeting. I, we were in the Philippines at that time. A typhoon came. You know what a typhoon is? I don't know whether you know a typhoon that ever arrives here in South Africa, South Africa, but it's just water, buckets and buckets of water. Wind. Typhoon came on that night. I didn't know. We were not watching news. I have no television. We threw the television away in 2010. And I know what's happening. And so typhoon came. And somebody, oh, there's a typhoon. And here I am preaching in an open basketball court. And it's, it's interesting because the enemy knows exactly when to distract your meeting. That's when you're about to close. And so here I am about to close, about to make an appeal, and this thing comes. And the people, about 200 people there, about to run in different directions. And I told them, hold your horses. Stay where you are. Let's pray. <laughs> Father in heaven, your people need to make decision tonight. And the enemy wants to rob them of that decision. I ask that in the name of Jesus, cast that darkness out of this place. Such your people can make a decision tonight that they will know we serve a living God. In Jesus' name. Amen. I'm telling you, the young people is my witness. My wife is a witness. The moment we say amen, rain stopped. Wind came from the other direction and pushed. The wind flowing in the other direction. My translator, a pastor, says, Brother Jan, after, after we preached that night, Brother Jan, what if? I said, what do you mean, pastor? What if it didn't, you know, your prayers were not answered? And I looked at the pastor and said, Pastor, I have no plan B. I only had plan A. I knew God would deliver. Because I have seen it before. One more before I bring it to close. Whew. Time. Okay. I was flying to the United States. Didn't want to fly, but I had to fly because of work. And uh, I said, Lord, I will go. Fine. But I'm making, I'm pleading with you, make this trip a mission trip. So I went to the United States. I arrived there Friday night. Friday night, supposed to be a banquet for a meeting. Nope, it's Sabbath. No question about it. Not going. Missed the banquet. Instead, I stayed in my room, read the Bible, Sabbath school lesson, review. And then I said, okay, I, which church do I go to? I Googled. Oh, the Southern Asian Seventh-day Adventist Church. Oh, I saw the building. Oh, very nice. Oh, I, I like that. All right, let's go there. And then as I was scrolling down further, just to, I don't know, I mean, maybe the angel was scrolling it. I was scrolling it down, just my finger was on it. Oh, Wheaton, Spanish Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this thing that came, you need to go there. There's just a deep impression, you need to go there. And I thought, oh, Lord, no habla espanol. I don't speak Spanish. So, okay. 
But the person was there. So I okay, decided, okay, I will go. Check that one out. Went to church, arrived there. Sabbath school was already there. I sat in the back of the youth class. And they were all speaking in Spanish. I understood a little bit. And after that, the pastor turns to me after he closes, before closing, and he said, do you have something to add, brother? And I, I told him, well, could I add just short note, but in English? I says, yes. So I added it in English. And then after that, the, pa the youth pastor said, are you a pastor? I said, nope, not a pastor, nor son of the pastor. And he says, could you do the youth hour this afternoon? I said, yes, we'll do youth hour. Glad to spend time with the young people. So we did the youth hour that, that, that uh, afternoon. And he says, can you do one this evening? Okay, we'll do one this evening. After the evening went, the, the, the senior pastor were there. Could you do one tomorrow night? All right. Sunday night, I went to the meeting, come back. After Sunday night, could you do Monday night? I went there Monday night. Became Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night. Quite a long story short. Friday night, I made an appeal. Young people, God has been speaking to you throughout the week. It's no longer information that you need. You need to make a commitment to Jesus. How many of you want to give your life and be prepared for baptism? Eight young people came. Crying before the foot of the cross. And I thought to myself, Lord, man, if we only know how to ask you and what to ask you for, asking that which you promised, you always deliver. Anyway, cut the long story short. I was leaving now. The meeting is over. I'm at the airport. Lord, surely, in a plane this size, going back to Europe, there's at least 300 people there. Someone needs you. Put him next to me or her. So here I am. Took my Bible out. No hidden agenda. Put it right there on my seat. Oh, all uh, elderly lady came. I said, ah, she's nice. Please, Lord, let her be her. Nope. Young person comes, young lady. Ah, oh, she looks nice and sweet. Please, let her be her. Nope. Young man, look, a student. I enjoy time with student. Not her. Finally, I said, Lord, okay, which one? And there was a gentleman that came, tall gentleman. I'm short, so everyone is tall, right? Really tall, with a trench coat, tie. And he comes. Attach a case. I said to myself, uh-uh. So he opens the attach a case, takes three things out. Laptop, book, newspaper. And I said, the amount of things he took out, Lord, we are not going to have a conversation here. So he put his laptop thing there. He puts his arranges thing. I'm looking at him smiling and want to say something. He ignores me. You know, we're not to be rude. I've learned not to be rude, okay? So respect his space. So I said, it's okay. This is a long flight. I have at least eight to nine hours here. All right. So he opens his book and just reads without looking at me, not acknowledging my presence. Everyone else, but not me. I said, okay. I said, all right, Lord. Now I take a window seat. You know why? Because whenever the plane is taxiing, everyone looks out the window. And I am there waiting for him, smiling. He does not look. I said, bait number one, failed. Okay, bait number two. I have a kosher meal. I'm a vegetarian, but I have a kosher meal. You know why? Kosher meal. You know what a kosher meal is? Food for the Jew, right? Now there's a purpose for that. They look at the meal, they look at me, and they look at the meal. Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Jew? Where did that one come from? And they always ask, are you a Jew? And I say, yes, I am. Uh, how? I'm a spiritual Jew. What does that mean? They ask, they get. They ask a question, right? So that's the time when you can witness. Speak Bit by bit, you bring this conversation into a spiritual conversation. That's what I do. I train our young people and the church to bring a normal conversation into a spiritual conversation that leads them to a Bible study and to know who you believe in and what you believe in. So, 
It doesn't work. My meal comes, and this thing, I tell you, this meal is wrapped like a surgical tool. It's like a sterilized tool. And when you yank it open, it makes a lot of noise. So here I am yanking it open. But this guy just reads his book. I thought to myself, okay, Lord, not going to be rude. Cut the long story short, I fell asleep. I woke up, he's still reading the book. Man, I'm praying, Lord, please, I'm willing here. You put him there, so he must be. Meal comes, rejected. Finally, we're flying over Paris. We just flew over the English Channel. Now we're in France. And the pilot announces, we have an, an emergency. And I said, God has a sense of humor. Pilot says, we have an emergency. Our right engine is on fire. And we will have to make an emergency landing. And I thought to myself, Lord, you have a sense of humor. Because now I'm looking at him. He's looking into the ceiling of the plane, listening. And finally, finally, after seven hours, he turns the neck you know, the, the, the lever or the, the nail was released. And he looked. And there I am looking at him. He looks at me. Our eyes met for the first time. Right? And God does something wonderful. Because I opened my mouth and words came out. And you know what I could say? Do you want to pray with me? Who's going to say no? The plane could crash anytime. And he just nodded. And I said, Father in heaven, the same God who created the physical law that allows this plane to fly, I ask that in the name of Jesus, send your holy angel to fly this plane, save your people, and let them know that we serve a living God. In Jesus' name I pray. After that, I looked at him, and I asked him, you want to hear the promises of God? He nodded. So I took my Bible out, and just read him the promises. And I said, and then I began to ask him questions. And he just keeps nodding. So we had a Bible study. Genesis to Revelation in 45 minutes. The most passionate Bible study I've ever done in my life. Because this plane could go down anytime. And I wanted, I wanted to be recorded in heaven. That John Jan died doing what he loves best. Then, you know, God has a sense of humor. He adds bit by bit. You know, the pilot announces, where are you going to make an emergency landing? Before we do that, we will dump our fuel. So instead of dumping our fuel, flying around Paris, we will continue to Zurich. Plane flies. You can hear. You know, but again, that's what I'm saying. God adds to the urgency of his message. And I ask this guy, so, based on the things that we have studied, the plan of salvation, how he wants to save you and me. Do you want to accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior right here, right now? And finally, he said, yes. The first word he spoke was yes. I said, okay, let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for speaking to my friend's heart and doing the work of salvation in his life. Save him. In Jesus' name. Amen. After that, the plane landed in Zurich, emergency lights on the runway. Plane cup stand on standstill. He turns to me, and he said, you serve a mighty God. And I said, I know. Praise God. And he said, do you know what I do? And I said, no, you ignored me. And then he says, you know the plane engine? I says, yes. He says, I'm a designer. That's my job. And I said, really? And I said, you know what? That engine fire was for you. And he, told, he looked at me confused. Why? What do you mean? He says, you know what? Before I boarded this plane, I asked God, if there's someone who needs you, put him next to me. I thought it was the elderly lady who was nice and sweet. Nope. The young girl. Nope. The guy. Nope. You. I wanted to share with you from the very beginning. You ignored me. I'm, I'm not even a Jew. 
And I take a kosher meal such that you will look and you will say, are you a Jew? And I can tell you, yes, I'm a spiritual Jew. And you would ask why. And then we could go to the Word of God. And it didn't happen. That engine fire was for you. You know why, my friend? Because He wants to save you. Tears in His eyes. Still remember, He held my hand and said, thank you. Friends, why am I telling you this? We are just enjoying the crumbs of blessing of the Holy Spirit. We have not yet received fully what God has promised. And I am telling you, if this church would band together and plead with God for that which He promised, I am telling you, Pretoria would be one for Jesus. But it starts with me. Not you, me. If I'm a member of this church, it starts with me. It is me, it is me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. We are told in the spirit of prophecy that the clog of communication between us and God is, uh, the communication is blocked. It's clogged. By what? Worldliness. Love of display. Basically, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Church, in the name of Jesus, I plead with you, do not leave this church with the same thing you came in with. I plead with you. Let's stop doing this church thing every Sabbath. No, no. Let's leave that church thing kind of that we do. The things that we do, the notions. I'm not saying, what I'm saying is this. We come to church and we go back to the old way. And we come to church and we go back to the old way. We come back to church and we go to church. Let's, Lord, let's plead with God before we leave today. Lord, it stops right here, right now. Give us a wholesome religion. We need your spirit. And I will not let you go today until you bless me. I can go on forever, but I won't. So here it is. Here's my appeal. If the voice of God has spoken to you, the word of God says, harden not your heart. And if the word of God spoke to you in different aspects of your life, I don't know it, you know it. And you want to say, Lord, I respond to your voice today. If that is you, I invite you to stand where you are. Say, Lord, amen. I respond to your voice today. Only if God has spoken to you. If God did not speak to you, it's okay. You can remain sitting down. I will not bite you. I will not be angry at you. I will still hug you. I will not cancel you. No, don't worry. This cancel culture should not be in church. If you did not hear the voice of God, it's okay. But if you heard the voice of God and say, Lord, I heard your voice. Speak to me. And I'm yielding. I'm giving it to you. My second appeal. You have struggles. I don't know it. You know it. God knows it. And you want to say, Lord, this is my struggle. And I come to bring it before your feet this morning. If that is you, I invite you to kneel with me right here. Any young person, you have a struggle. You know it. God knows it. Come. Right here. We will pray together. Mighty God and everlasting Father, all glory, honor, and praise belongs to you and you alone. Father, this afternoon, we want to thank you and praise you that the glory of man is being laid to dust. And we want it laid to dust forevermore. Father, thank you for speaking to us. Thank you for your love and your mercy towards us. Thank you that you never give up on us. Father, I just want to thank you and praise you that your people have not hardened their heart to you this day, this morning. That they have responding to your voice. They recognize, oh Father, their need of you. And we come before you. Before you are your children kneeling down. 
because they have struggles. Struggles that need victory. Victory found only in Jesus. Father, I plead with you for mercy. Please inject upon them, upon their life, a fresh injection of your spirit. That they can be the people that you have called them to be for you in these last days. Regardless of the struggles, Father, you will uphold them in the midst of their struggles. That you will use their struggle, O oh Father, what the many may meant for evil, you'll turn it to good and a blessing. Father, there are also those among us here who need your spirit more than anything else. And we plead with you to fulfill your promise. Please, O oh Father, bless this church, the leadership of this church, the guests that are here today, everyone that has walked into this place. May they leave this place revived, renewed, ready for the transformation work of your Holy Spirit daily in their lives, that they can be a witness unto others, that we serve a living God and Jesus, our Jesus who is coming soon. Father, thank you that we can come to you even with the prayers that we that are lodged in our hearts that we have not uttered with anyone's presence, in anyone's presence. We utter them to you right now. And we just want to thank you and praise you that you heard our prayers not for our sake, but for the sake of Christ. And in his name we pray. Amen.